Hello and welcome to another Real Talk Food Safety with Jill and Tia. And as you can see, Tia looks a little different today. I want to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Darren Detweiler, who is graciously um, coming on our show today to talk about change theory and food safety and all that other stuff. Right, Darren? That's the idea. And, and again, thank you for inviting me to talk today. And um, I, I really think that when we we, we engage in real talk about food safety. Um, we have to, we have to bring in some different actors from time to time and we have to recognize different audiences and different messages and, and uh, different platforms. There's so many variables involved and I'm grateful to be one of these variables today. <laughs> well, it's always, del it's always delightful to talk with you because you bring like a whole new set of perspectives and there's always a few laughs that come along. And, you know, I think for our audience, they're going to have a real treat today. I look forward to it. Yes. And so speaking of our audience, I know LinkedIn just gave me a message and said, Hey, I'm having trouble connecting, but now it says it's fine. So if you are joining us today, you know, we always love to know that you're out there and where you're joining us from. So you know how this works in the comments, you know, put where you're coming in from. And if you are here live or on replay, we do go back and look for comments or people who view this later because it's stored on our YouTube channel later, because I'm sure there's going to be nuggets today that Darren's going to share with us that you're going to want to go back and look, watch again. <laughs> so no pressure, no pressure at all. I mean, no pressure, Darren. So. So Darren, here I'm, I'm thinking about our audience and there may be, you know, some people who maybe aren't as familiar with you or kind of like your space in food safety and your journey in food safety. Sure. Do you mind starting off just telling us a little bit about you and kind of what brought you here? Uh, thank you. Um, you know, we all are consumers. Everyone is impacted by food. Some of us work in the food industry. Some of us work in food safety. Uh, and some of us are just consumers. But the reality is, is that, you know, food is a, a, a part of our fabric of, of life. And for me, my involvement in food safety began almost 30 years ago. Uh, you know, I look back uh, at, at the 1993 Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak, and there's certain memories that are just burned into my mind. One mm -hmm. is, is um, you know, finding a, a note uh, taped to my 16 month old's uh, daycare center door saying that another child had tested positive for E. coli and to look for these symptoms. Um, another memory is, is uh, sitting in a hospital bed holding my 16 month old as he had an IV um, inserted and, and he was sick and looked at the IV bag hanging from a, a pole and he thought it was a bottle. It, you know, it was a container of liquid with marks. It looked like a bottle, but he couldn't have it because his renal f function was, was not um, proper. And, and we were awaiting test results for E. coli. Um, I remember struggling to see him in his little tufts of blonde hair sticking out from um, one of those space blankets as he was strapped into um, a, a gurney being taken to a helicopter to be flown to Children's Hospital. I remember struggling to see him in his hospital bed at Children's Hospital, surrounded and dwarfed by wires and tubes and monitors and, um, you know, sitting there and learning about E. coli and learning about uh, all the the intricate aspects of, of a foodborne outbreak and and pathogens and how uh, you know the the media and the medical community and the industry was having a conversation seemingly for the first time about some of these issues. Um, and then I remember seeing him again outside of a hospital being carried in the world's smallest coffin. And these are not memories that, um, any parent should have, you know, no parent should live with a chair forever empty at their family table. But there was a couple of things that I was also dealing with. Um, uh, you know, President Bill Clinton had just been um, inaugurated, just took office. I had spoke with him on live television and, and the day after my son died, 
he called our house uh, from Air Force One to express his condolences. And speaking father to father, you know, we, we talked about this idea of, of, you know, what do you do as a parent in this situation and, and, and what does legacy mean? And I thought really hard then, and I've continued over three decades to think about this idea of I lost my son, but my son does not have to have lost his father. Um, I also think about this idea of, do I want to go to bed at night knowing that I did nothing to prevent another parent from living with that chair forever empty at the family table? So it's been, you know, not only a professional journey that I've, I've gone through for the last three decades, but a, a personal uh, journey. And the stories that I told back then, the way that I engaged with, with audiences back then, is not how I do it today. It's it's definitely mm -hmm. evolved over time, um, and and there there are lessons that I have learned uh, from other families. Mm -hmm. And one lesson I learned just before we move on here is that I had I remember learning in 1993 after my son's death about um, I mean I knew about the jungle written in 1906 by Upton Sinclair. But I had never before been exposed to this London Daily Times literature review from 1906 of The Jungle, in which it hmm. said, in, in reviewing the book as a novel, right, before it talked about characters and all that kind of stuff, it started talking about how the things described by Mr. Sinclair happened yesterday and are happening today and tomorrow and the next day until some Hercules comes to cleanse the filthy stable. Mm -hmm. And that sat with me for a long time. Until I had an opportunity to meet up with this woman who I had met up with her and her family about four years earlier after her son uh, survived an E. coli illness. Uh, but while um, undergoing um, dialysis, this young boy ended up having a stroke and ultimately lost the use of his left arm. So I was going to a conference and I, I, I was in this family's hometown and I met up with the mom and we were talking about how um, he often talks about how he can't play in the schoolyard like all the other boys. And she handed me a drawing to, to look at. It was this crayon colored superhero in flight, you know, with a cape and tights and that kind of a thing. And she said how she was talking with him about what this drawing was about. And the, this, this boy said that he wished that someone in the food industry, someone somewhere, had seen something, said something, done something different um, so that he would not have to, again, not be able to play like all the other kids. But that that's, that person would be a superhero in, you know, in, in his eyes. And it wasn't someone in a suit or a smock or a, a, a lab coat or, 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 you know, anything you would associate with what someone, you know, connected to the food industry would wear. Um, but this idea of Herculean effort, you know, there is no Hercules in this day of Marvel and DC superheroes. There's no, there's no Hercules that's going to come and, and, you know, make magically make every problem go away. But it really is this Herculean effort that's needed at every stage from every person at every moment along the journey of food from the farm to the fork. And that this Herculean effort, it's, it's something that requires an enormous amount of work, Mm -hmm. strength and courage. And while we can find policies and science and technology that can help us with our, our strength and, and, and that work, that courage is something that we need to support. We need to think about in terms of that true understanding of, of, of food safety, the true burden of disease, understanding that there's much more than just data and statistics. Mm -hmm. There are people and lives and families and stories behind these numbers. There's also people and stories and lives behind everyone who works in the food industry. Again, because we're all connected in, in this, this fabric of, of uh, you know, food being a part of our lives. So it's, it's not any one moment or, or, or one event that, that's kind of changed um, how I look at and, and think about food safety, but but I realize that everyone is different in this journey, and I try to you know really uh, really think about how I I, I reflect on and, and change how I engage with everyone um, mm -hmm. 
of my audiences and talking about food safety. Darren, you know, uh, your story, I think, always touches hearts. And when I hear you talk about your son, Riley, and what what you went through, I, I can't even imagine. But I think what always stands out is, like you said, kind of how right, we, we create our stories, we tell our stories. And I really admire and respect how, how you, you've changed the story. And you choose the parts of the stories um, that help you move in the direction to make that change and to make sure that that dad's still there. And you know, I love that story about how do we display this Herculean effort? And I've heard you tell this story before. And every time I go, I pick up something new in your story. <laughs> um, you know, and I think about how, especially right as food safety experts, we're always talking about numbers and data and statistics. And we hear this over and over everywhere. It's right. It's everything that we talk about. Um, you know, but food safety culture isn't program driven. It's people driven. And, you know, how do we bring kind of that, the people focus back in and not just from, you know, just the periphery, but making it the center of our story and leading from there and how we support people in this whole dynamic versus focusing always on the data first. They, they're they always so important together, but yet. Well, they know, are important together. I think that grounds us in this right? It's people. People are still doing the Herculean effort with data, with science, with, with all these other parts. Well, I mean, I, the data is important, right? We have to, you know, how do we measure things? How do we validate things? How do we um, convince whether it's financing or, or, you know, so many different aspects and, and numbers are definitely a part of it. Uh, sure. But I, what I've found is that, um, you know, numbers can almost hide oh the reality absolutely. oh you yes know, there's there's a a, a a quote from mark twain about how you know data can can essentially change anything um, um depending on what you choose and, and how you display it um but you know there, there's a piece of data that's really been kind of stuck in my head at least and i know other people's um uh reaction to this um, the CDC's estimates about food safety have been relatively unchanged. 48 million Americans are sick, 120,000 hospitalized, and 3,000 die every year. Can, of all the policy and science and, and our, our food safety culture, how is it that those numbers have not changed by even 1% uh, in, in three decades? Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you start looking at this visually, um, you know, I have a photo that that i took uh of of my son you know it's weird because i took a photo of riley in the hospital because i assumed he was going to recover and at 16 months of age you know there, there's no way to explain what's going on to him i assumed that he would you know recover and he would grow older and and he'd be at an age where i can talk about how brave he was and how strong he was and, and how proud I am of him being able to, um, you know, be where he is at that point later in his life. And I recently was con uh, consulting with a family whose child is in a ch another children's hospital in the same kind of situation. And it's amazing. I, I look at these two pictures that are 30 years apart and those pictures don't look any different, mm. you know? Um, so, you know, how many people look at these pictures? How many people understand, you know, what this is? And when I talk with certain audiences, um, you know, th this, this, this opportunity creates so many different messages that I get. And I remember talking to uh, some, some assembly line, uh, you know, food workers at a, at a plant one time. And we were talking about food safety and this, this one guy, if I remember correctly, he was from the warehouse. Um, he worked in the warehouse, okay. but he was part of this conversation. And he goes, well, my motivation, I feel bad because my motivation is kind of selfish. I don't want to become sick from this. And I, I don't mm -hmm. want to, you know, um, you know, see my 
daughter sick from this kind of a thing. And I'm like, there's nothing selfish about that at all. Not at all. Um, you know, we don't have to be doing this because of the bottom line and the budget and because of, of, of regulatory compliance and, 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 and supporting our company. I mean, those are all good and important things, but it's also okay for us to be humans and say, I'm doing this because I think it's ethically and morally the right thing to do. And, and I would not want my family to become, you know, victim to uh, food that could harm them. That's what everyone needs to think. I mean, you know, if you think about it, um, there, there are certain things as parents. We say, look both ways before you cross the street. Wear your seatbelt at all times. Um, you know, um, hold my hand while we're crossing the street or, or you know, be careful of you know, what information you put out there on the Internet because of stranger danger. We are aware of certain invisible threats True. Uh, and, and, and um, unpredictable um, situations out there. But we don't necessarily talk about that in terms of food. And if we... Think about this idea of food safety culture, which is right now, there's a lot of discussion about food safety culture. What I find interesting is that this food safety culture is kind of limited in scope and scale in terms of it's only being talked about in terms of the industry. Mm. When are we talking about food safety culture in terms of consumers as well? Because that last mile of food's journey, that last mile of food safety definitely includes consumers as as a dominant stakeholder in this in in, in this journey mm -hmm. and uh, i think that we have to talk to those who work in the food industry also as consumers and we have to talk about consumers who don't work in the food industry in terms of of of, of food safety culture and that is not an easy message to send and these Diverse audiences really require you to have a little bit more skill set and a bit more of a message beyond, let me tell you the story of my son. Mm -hmm. um, because people want to know, what's what's my call to action? What are the next steps? What are things I can do? What can I prioritize? You know, what what message can I give to those I work with? Yeah, and around it. You have to be prepared to do. Yeah. You know, and I think that's always been an area that we we're not sure how to approach or where, where we go with that. And so, you know, I think that's actually a really fantastic lead into kind of what we're going to talk about today. If you're okay, go in there because um, for those of you who don't know, Darren is currently in the process of writing a graphic novel series on food safety called bites of truth. And later we're going to drop a link in our, on our page so that you can um, see a little bit more about it and hopefully even help support making this come to reality because this is really um, you're, what you're doing and tell me if I'm on the right page and I understand this right but like through a story through stories about a family that's kind of in a small island community which we've talked about is kind of based on a model um, readers really learn about food safety and contamination and how that relates to public health and how they can be advocates of food safety as well. Well, and thank you for mentioning that book. <clears throat> and it's a it's a um, it's in significant contrast to my first two books. My first two books about food safety really were meant for industry and academia. Mm -hmm. And I, as a professor, I've used these in my courses. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I've used it with, with academia. But, you know, I, I think that the only coffee table they're on is my dad's because I gave him free <laughs> coffee and said, hey, throw it on your coffee table. Um, but but this idea of, look, there are important messages for the industry, but there's also important messages right. for those who are not in the industry. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, part of this came about um, as a professor. I teach a lot of different courses, not just food safety or food policy, but I, I also teach entrepreneurship and uh, uh, global corporate social responsibility and sustainability. And through a lot of these courses with grad students, I really kept encountering and employing or, or utilizing this idea of change theory. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had long said that, that um, uh, industry, my big three takeaways for industry are to prioritize food safety, to invest in food safety, and to train around food safety. And I've realized that I have to 
think about my work. I have to prioritize, mm -hmm. invest, and train myself on these issues. And here I'm using change theory with my students. I had to start using change theory in terms of what I do. And so, um, you know, why don't we bring up? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me bring um, this on in. We'll bring up the, the tablet here and I can share it with you. Yeah, because I, I love talking about this because you've taken it to the next step to say not just how do we do things in the food industry and manufacturing, but then like how do we make it practical? Because this is for families, this is for consumers. Really, everybody needs to be part of the conversation. But I think one a while back, you and I had a conversation about there hasn't been something in food safety so compelling that it's made like a TV series where people are talking about it. And so how what other avenues do we have to engage consumers in learning more about food safety? Yeah, I mean, E. coli does come up in TV shows a little bit as you know, a side piece, like, you know, a lamp or a, hmm. a plot device kind of a thing. I think <laughs> the most significant time E. coli was brought up, and this may be um, uh, way back for a lot of people in our audience, but there was a TV series, there was a TV movie and a miniseries and then a TV show called V, but these aliens that came, it was like very 1980s. And ultimately at the end of the, the how did the entire show resolve itself back in its original series? Uh, they realized that the aliens uh, had never been exposed to E. coli. Again, this was in the 80s. This was before the Jack in the Box outbreak. So they spread E. coli in powder form all over these agricultural fields hmm. with crop dusters, and it forced the aliens to leave uh, kind of a thing. Uh, I've seen food safety talked about, you know, like in Law and Order or um, every once in a while in a medical show. Uh, I even recently heard E. coli mentioned, but but it's never really been you know, talked about in terms of what it is or the, you know, again, that true burden of disease. Uh, but, but the theory of change is just a way for uh, people who are trying to, you know, start a business or focus how they consult or focus how they speak or focus how they're going to change their practices and protocols within the food industry to, to really kind of change some things. So it's, it's a methodology. I didn't invent this. But it is a methodology for planning, participation, adaptive management, even evaluation that the company's philanthropy um, efforts, non, uh, NGOs, et cetera, can use, but specifically to promote social change. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I really love about this. Yeah, because so it has that underlying part, right? The promote social change. Right. So. Right, because it's not about, you know, um, profit it's not about these things it's it's all about social change so when we initially look at it the idea of you have various and i'll, I'll explain this in a second here inputs we can identify the key issues what activities we're going to be doing and outputs and outcomes and then how we can measure them along with these specific goals mm -hmm. so you know looking at a problem or a dilemma and then being able to take it all the way through to these goals. So I work with this worksheet um, or a variation of this worksheet with my students in so many different classes. And um, with this book, Bites of Truth, we kind of, uh, I'm, I'm co-writing this with another professor who works in the food uh, safety and food policy arena, Dr. Gabriella Steyer. And we look at this as the idea of mm -hmm. our focus is food safety culture and resources for impact on consumers' knowledge and behavior. So we weren't mm -hmm. talking about industry, right? We were talking about consumers. Consumers. It's that social aspect. Right. Social change. What we observed is that food safety culture is growing within industry, but like I mentioned earlier, not as fast in terms of those outside the industry um, or, or, you know, who are consumers. Mm -hmm. So then I ultimately, you know, skip all the way to what's our biggest goal, right? Well, we want to have good health and well-being. And I typically look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as, as an easy, well-defined goal here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not trying to have an ultimate goal of increasing profit or more Department of Justice activity or, you know, changing certain things. I just want this in terms of that social impact on good health and well-being. So now I've bookended, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what I've observed and where my goal is. So based on what I observed, based on what we observed, um, what needs to change? 
Information about food safety and outbreaks and the impact on public health needs to be accessible to readers, audiences, if you will, uh, that we could just describe solely as consumers. Right. To reach so, another category outside of the normal groups that we talk food safety with. Right. I mean, I talk with lawyers. I talk with R&D. I talk with labeling experts. I talk with executives of the C-suite. I talk with, you know, food safety NGOs. There's so many different audiences. Uh, but I really think that focusing on, well, what about the audience that's not in most, they're not usually at that table, right? Mm -hmm. They're not usually at the same conferences that we go to. Um, you know, no one goes to a food safety conference just, hey, I'm here just as a consumer. They're usually <laughs> there to represent some company that has a stake in the business of food safety mm -hmm. or, or at least of food. Uh, so what about outside of that audience? So our activity, our approach, our option we decided to explore was to write and publish a series of graphic novels that tell the stories of the true burden of disease through a fictional outbreak. Um, and it's important to note that we're writing this fictional outbreak and, and all this story. We're using actual cases. We're using actual events. We're using actual uh, people's journey. We're using actual doctors' experiences and victims and families' experiences, uh, but couching it into this this uh, model that is simply a, a fictional outbreak. Mm -hmm. um, um, so our hope here is that uh, readers will be as stakeholders. Readers will be able to understand key concepts that relate to victims and their families, connect causes to outcomes, and become more proactive in terms of their role in food safety. Right. Something that helps them think beyond the normal, like the, the classic question of, well, pizza that was left overnight, is that okay to eat? Or yeah. taking temperatures in products, right? Those are the things that at least I hear my family ask these questions. And I get those calls. Hey, we just <laughs> had a, a family get together and there's this huge thing of macaroni and cheese and my my son-in-law decided to leave it in the in the oven. Uh, it was turning, he turned off the oven, but he left it in the oven overnight. Is it okay? And, um, he thinks it's okay to eat now. And I'm like, oh, is it? Um, you know, I'll get conversations. I was recently interviewed in AARP and I want to believe they, wanted to interview me because of my expert level of knowledge, not because of, of my age. Um, um, but it was about family get togethers um, mm -hmm. and reunions and food safety. And, um, you know, we were talking about a lot of things, people that they prepare food at home, but they're not thinking about those vulnerable audiences, the very young, the very mm -hmm. elderly, those who may be immunocompromised, um, how some foods or some, quality and safety level of foods may have a much more significant impact on those uh, participants than on others. Mm -hmm. And they'll prepare food and they'll put it in their trunk and they'll drive for a couple hours and then they let it sit out for a couple hours and then they take leftovers and they drive home for a couple hours. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, this food that should have been, you know, keep hot food hot or cold food cold has been uh, in the danger zone for six, oh, eight, hours. 12 hours or so. And you wonder why people get sick. Cringe, cringe. Um, Definitely cringe worthy there, right? Yeah. Um, so we looked at the industry. How could this impact the industry? Uh, perhaps the industry could feel more pressure from uh, consumers and become more focused on their food safety responsibilities beyond economic and legal mm -hmm. responsibilities and pressures. And we looked at this idea, what can we measure, right? We could look at perhaps maybe sales indicate number of increased resources, number of you know, increased number of readers. Maybe the social media buzz could Im indicate uh, the impact of the story. Yeah. But we don't end there because what we wanted to do was look at the potential um, obstacles. Oh, Obviously, yeah. there's costs associated with publishing a book. Um, and we cannot guarantee that our book will have this impact on readers. And we yeah. can't guarantee that the, uh, the, this book, these books will have an impact on industry. We also noted, though, that we can't ignore the fact that it's impossible to connect these books directly to decreases in foodborne illness. Um, but we have to assume that, you know, like the idea of, you know, you see thousands of starfish. That, what's that story? You see thousands of starfish on the beach uh, washed up and they're all going to dry out and die. And you go and you you see a guy pick up one and throw it in. And, and the guy goes up to says, you can't possibly save all those 
thousands of starfish from drying out in the sun and then but the guy who picked up the starfish goes well i helped that one you know <laughs> if we can be part of if we can be part of the 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 um the solution if we can be part of this narrative of, of talking about the true burden of disease if we can be part of this growing food safety culture that focuses solely on uh the consumer then we can only um i guess assume that that we'll have some kind of an impact so this is how we used uh this and here's a, a blank of this well, this is how we used um <clears throat> well and i like this concept because i think you know if we're in let's say we're in food safety and we're like how can we use change theory like the concepts that you just walk through with the methodology are actually very similar to what we do when we talk about risks or when we talk about trying to understand a process better or is a system working right there's always well here's what we need to know here's the problem here's how we're going to measure it here can get in the way but i think this even helps give a broader perspective of thinking Sometimes we get really granular right away. And here kind of staying up at maybe like the 10,000 or 30,000 foot view to say, overarching, how are we gonna do this? And I think that in part comes from the social change. It's a much bigger, um, broader canvas than you know when we get real granular. You know, well, and as you know, we do this, I just wanna comment. I love seeing that there's, um, in our comments, people are talking about too, just the ways that they help connect you know, as they're doing training um, and connecting this to families and how it really impacts everyone. Or Stephanie, thanks for sharing. You're working on a computer game, right? Something relatable for people in today's day and age to say, how do we relate better to food safety? And what are those ways to do that? So, well, one of the things I encountered recently was uh, a gentleman who was a sponsor of a project. This guy was investing into a company that helped uh purify water in certain mm -hmm. parts of Africa. And um, at one point he was sharing about how he was developing an economic model and how they were going to do all this change. And then about four months later, I was talking with him again and he pulled, he was almost like apologetic that he pulled out of that project. And what it came down to was that he realized that they didn't have the setup that was needed, they didn't have the data that was needed to be able to measure and validate the change. Oh. And one of the things I like about this process is, you know, it's one thing to have an idea, right? I'm going to do this. <clears throat> okay. But okay, so so how is this going to impact? And what is the mm -hmm. ultimate goal you're trying to achieve? And how are you going to communicate this to those around you? Maybe those who need to fund or give you permission to do that work. But also, how are you going to validate its ability to meet those targets in order to achieve those goals and come up with these potential obstacles uh, and be real about that? And so mm -hmm. this, this you know theory of change, it doesn't give you the answers, but it gives you a model to really have these these sometimes tough conversations with those you're working on with these projects uh, to come about this. There's there's another um, um, example yeah. I want to share very quickly yeah. is that there was a um, company I was consulting with and they were concerned because there were certain there were certain food safety failures that were being observed in different parts of the plant. At one time, um, there was a, a problem with uh, pallets in the warehouse. Another time there was a problem with uh, a, a maintenance issue um, mm. and an allergen and control. And um, uh, which are real and, things we all encounter. We've right. seen them. <laughs> but they, the, 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 the vice president of food safety and quality was essentially saying that we need to do something different because we keep set, we keep having the same food safety conversations with the same audiences. We're not getting all the audiences we want. Oh, yeah. So that idea of of um, again, we can go with the idea of of um, 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 health and well being, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea of of uh, problems uh, in various. I'm kind of paraphrasing. Uh, places in facilities mm -hmm. that keep recurring, right? Right. It's like we keep having the same, like you said, the same conversations lead to the same outcomes. So right. 
how do we shift conversations? And I love that you're going to use this example to show how this company approached it. I like what you said, shift conversations, um, 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 a wider audience uh, in the company. And yeah. so their thought on this, again, in, in, in consultation, when we talked through this, was the idea to have what they called um, um, an employee-led uh, food safety oh, nice. committee. Nice. And this was a really cool idea because they what they wanted to do was essentially invite at least one person from every single division, maintenance, warehouse, security, um, uh, um, uh, distribution, even uh, like the people that did the sourcing of, of ingredients and, and spices, basic, and, and someone from the legal counsel. Everyone, you know, like it's like every division was represented here. Um, Which is awesome. It's recognizing that our team members are extremely resourceful. Right. And actually want to be part of the solution when we give them those opportunities. The next two words, though, are the things that excited me the most. Oh, which are? They wanted employees to be able to mentor their peers ah. as another level. Like they're not going to do away with their food safety training. They're not going to do away with their policies and protocols. But the idea that from this employee-led food safety committee could be people who are now uh, able to mentor, whether it's a new employee or the mm. people they work with, to be this additional level of, hey, here's why we got to do this, or here's why this is a problem, or yeah. hey, don't do it that way, do it this way, and let me show you how, uh, because of of their ability to to extend from this committee back into the their their division, the the, the facility, wherever. Yeah, it sounds then, like almost like a food safety ambassador and well, helping build a community within these areas to talk about food safety versus having it be something isolated where we only talk about, you know, yield and productivity or these type of things. Like, no, yeah. part of the conversation now is going to include food safety. The second word here, though, is what also really captured my attention, which was... This would be seen as a way to really look at their 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 wide employee work, you know, their workforce in terms of having ownership of food safety. It's not what's expected of them. Yeah, you know, it's not just what's expected of them. It's not just what's in protocols and procedures. It's not just what's you know trained to them, but there's this ownership about food safety uh that that would come about. Um and for yeah. the the uh for you know for the company here. They saw, you know, how how would they better support a wider audience? Not just supporting the the vice president of food safety and quality right. assurance, or the you know the the or that person's team, but how would they better support uh, and even um, validate that mm -hmm. ownership, validate the value in what they're doing when it comes to food safety? Uh, and and we looked at this in terms of the targets. We looked at the idea of of more reporting, mm. you know, within the, uh, within the company, we okay. look at the idea of, of, uh, more engagement. Yes. When people have feel that they can have more ownership, right. They're typically more engaged. Those two go hand in hand, but they also initiated this idea of creating a company-wide survey of, of how the work, how their workforce uh, thought about food safety, what they knew about food safety, what their, what their uh, um, feeling was and that, you know, how they prioritized food safety and the work they were doing. They wanted to see a, a, a change in these numbers as well. Now, mind you, again, there's no guarantees, right? So we have no mm -hmm. guarantees. On like what they'll actually be able to deliver. Right. But what they wanted to see was that that would this and would this really kind of maximize 
you know, that, that would, would, would it be a multiplier of the work that we're doing? And would it really kind of, uh, you know, increase that focus that we're going on? So what I like about this is that essentially what came about from this process was refined and edited into a, a mission statement for this uh, employee led food safety commission uh, committee. And, and when they took this to not only the C-suite, but also to the finance department in terms of, we want to take one, you know, we want to take a committee for each facility and they're in multiple States recognizing that there were multiple shifts like the mm -hmm. day shift and the night shift. Right. And, basically have multiple opportunities for people to engage in this committee. And by the way, they need to be compensated because this would be outside their normal work day. And so when oh. it came time to, to, um, uh, so one obstacle was the money side of things, right. Um, it was going through this process that they were able to, you know, again, it's it's like it's like an elevator pitch, right? You need to have your 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 ducks in a row. You need to have your eyes dotted and your T's crossed. And you need to be able to to show what is going to be the impact, what's going to be the value add, what are our measurables we're going to have, and how can we validate? How can we how can we you know um, you know what's our return on investment? I guess is 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 what some of these audiences were specifically looking for in terms of being able to say we need to spend X amount of dollars to do this and to meet you know once a quarter with this committee to do this work and here's what we think we're going to see. And it's one thing to have again, it's one thing to have that idea. It's another thing to go through all this these steps to be able mm -hmm. to uh, uh, connect with those who are in your 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 team, your army of change, if you will, uh, and, and then to uh, to make sure that something like this can be executed. Yeah. Well, you know, and the cool thing about it is it's, I mean, granted, you could make it more than one page, but oh, yeah. you can be disciplined and say, let's just do one page because now it's a one page communication, which people like succinct communication, but it also incorporates all these pieces that we know people are going to ask about. Like, well, what's the goal? How are we going to do it? How will we measure it? What's going to get in the way? So instead of having to just remember those and have it like as a checklist, as you're having a conversation, as you're creating something, right? it's another template that can help like guide you to the change that you want to see, but also really serve as communication tools. Because right? no, has anybody ever said, wow, you, you were over communicating on what we were going to be doing? Well, <laughs> it's almost as if you were there in the room. We did turn this into a one page document. Uh, it did go through many uh, edits and, you know, I'm just showing you a quick version yeah. of it, but this is like the very first rough draft of it. But one of the things here um, with, with uh, the, 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 uh, the outcomes for the support and validate, we talked about this in terms of um, it was one thing to have, maintenance and warehouse and shipping and and security and and you know this team that team uh involved in it but if we didn't have any of the executives involved in these meetings if we didn't have you know any of the the suits if you will we didn't have any of these people what message would that send mm -hmm. to to those who did participate in this and that if it is a company if it's part of the mission statement that this is a priority and yet no one from, you know, the executive offices was was a part of this. That kind of undermines that message to, you know, okay. the other end of the spectrum, the other, you know, end of the pyramid or totem pole, whatever you want to call it, uh, in terms of how would this be sustainable? How would this be effective and tr send a true message in terms of that this is something we're going to prioritize, we're going to execute, and we're going to have it be something that could be sustainable uh, over a long period of time? Yeah. Yeah, that, that that brings up a whole nother conversation that I find really fascinating for another show <laughs> about how when we look to leadership, sometimes we give away our ownership and our accountability and put our faith kind of in leaders. But that's a whole nother conversation. Well, I'll, I'll just leave this here. I I grew or I, I draw great inspiration from a, 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 a friend of mine who is uh, he, he runs the food division. Uh, for a, one of the resorts and, and casinos in, in Las Vegas. And I believe they have 19 restaurants and some other, you know, there's room service and catering, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but when he was hired, 
uh, he said two things. One is I never want to be forced to wear a suit because I want to be able to uh, blend in with the food uh, uh, you know, workers and, and wear a, a chef's coat so that I don't look like an outsider. And two is we have an annual training and the general manager of the entire casino has to be there because it mm. says right here in your and everything that ultimately responsible responsibility uh, for, for food uh, is under that element of the uh, the general manager. So the general manager has to be present in our annual training. And the guy signed off on this. And he was telling me how many other casinos, when he was trying to find out how many other casinos in Las Vegas, the general manager um, never attends anything, never has anything to do, even though it does play a part in the responsibility for food safety. Um, and uh, so that was, again, this idea of if you're going to be a company that supports and validates the work of many people down here in mm -hmm. terms of food safety, you got to show that you're involved in it up here as well. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of leads to a question about, right, because change theory and different ways for changing um, or how you approach it in that methodology, right? That's something that I don't want to say we've always been looking for the key or what can, what can help us navigate that change process easier, faster, better. You know, from the work that you've done, where do you see that people struggle the most with change? Um, well, I got to tell you, uh, as a professor who's also been an assistant dean, I've been in education for very long. I was a public school teacher for 16 years. I taught high school math and science. Uh, I've been here at the university now for many years. Um, when you have change and then all of a sudden, you know, we're going to put like, like this, this, uh, this, uh, employee led food safety committee, right? We're going to have this new thing. We're going to do it. Right. And we're going to get behind it and we're going to do it. We're going to make it a big thing and everyone's going to do it or whatever it is. Right. And we have training about it. And then the person who was the, who spearheaded this activity moves on to another company or retires or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden someone comes in and goes, well, we don't need this anymore. So we're just going to get rid of this and we're going to do something different. And for those longtime employees that are, the ones who see, okay, how come this was such a priority? And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. it's not a priority. And I think that change theory has to look at the idea of sustainability. And that sustainability has to go beyond current leadership. Because once, you know, once once that person who spearheads, let's say this again, this, this employee-led food safety committee uh, retires or, or, or is promoted to a different kind of position or moves to another company. Um, ideally, if it's good, if it's developed well, and if it really is a good, um, a, 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 a well-developed and established uh, uh, practice, it should extend far beyond just the person who's babysitting it as their their pet project, their pet yeah. initiative, right? And I've seen that so, so many times where this was our priority number one. This is our priority number one. And then that person leaves and now it's gone. Now it's, now it's, now, and what does that mean when we're left behind, right? Yeah. You it's, know, so that change is okay, mm -hmm. but getting rid of something completely, sometimes what is, what is the message that that sends to, to, to employees? Yeah, no, you know, and that's really interesting because sometimes right when, when we start new roles or new people come in or there's a change in leadership, there's kind of this energy around like what's going to happen and what will be shifting. Um, you know, and I think I, you know, put that challenge out there about for many companies, they got to where they are by doing many good things. So what are the parts that we need to be curious about and understand more that we need to really honor and hold close and go, these things made a difference before we jump in and go, I already know we need to do X, Y, and Z. Like, no, what are the things already working and how do we keep those and improve or enhance on those or before we start putting all the new things in? <laughs> well, if we, if we flip that script that you just lined out or uh, laid out there, when you look at some of these companies that get into serious food safety Ooh, problems, sometimes. it's usually because they were focused more on the short term than the long term. 
true. When you hear these companies go, we're going to do things differently now. We're going to reinvest in this. We're going to review our this. We're going to double up on this. I always ask, why weren't you doing that all along? Why weren't you constantly reviewing your protocols? Why weren't you constantly um, training Checking your employees? Training why weren't that. you constantly? Uh, why didn't you already have someone in charge of this kind of a thing? It's like, you know, if we learn the lesson from the idea of being um, short term versus long term thinking, I think that this idea of theory of change uh, now takes on a different light because perhaps we've got to look at these changes in terms of something that's sustainable and that can be that can take place over a long period of time. That being said, however, if you look at environmental sustainability, right, if you look at um, a lot of um, sustainability efforts by state and county and even city governments. Um, I had a conversation recently with a person that, that uh, for the city of Long Beach, California, she's their sustainability mm -hmm. officer. She said when she took it over, the biggest thing they learned was that all these sustainability environmental goals were written with a 10 year plan. And 10 years is too long because mm -hmm. there's too many shifts in administration and leadership within 10 years. They had to shift to a five year uh, uh, timeline in terms of their targets. So when we look at, a, at this idea of this, this theory of change worksheet and you look at targets, you don't want to have targets that will be me measured in 10 years. You want to have targets that are going to be measured, you know, whether it be six months, a year, two years down the road, so that you can always have the ability to not only collect that data, analyze that data and validate that data, but to make changes yeah. uh, to support the sustainability of this change, as opposed to 10 years from now, now we evaluate the data and realize it wasn't what we wanted to get. So we're going to scrap the whole thing. Yeah. And that's a great point, right? Because we know how quickly things change. So change theory also needs to include part of that flex to go, things shift really quickly. The yeah. environmental factors change quickly. Business factors change quickly. So how do we make, how do we put that as part of the conversation when we're even approaching Hey, let's use change theory to do, you know, shift something in our business, whether it's food safety culture or a new program or it's sustainability, whatever it is. How do we keep that in mind? Well, and change is definitely like in terms of food safety, change is the soup du jour, if you will. I mean, at, at when I started in this work with food safety, it was all USDA and meat. There was a significant shift to food safety when you look at recalls being more about uh, food regulated by the FDA. We've looked at romaine lettuce and leafy greens uh, right now, ice cream and, and, mm -hmm. and peanuts and peanut butter. And right now there's also just change in terms of how consumers are getting their foods. It used to be restaurants and retail. Then there's hybrid. And mm -hmm. now people are buying things online or, or they're having you know, an app with the third party delivery and even third party shoppers. And there's concerns over uh, the, the certification for food safety of these delivery folks or, or of the food safety by companies that don't have a traditional brick and mortar that fall mm -hmm. under FDA model food code. So there's always going to be a, a reason to have a, a focus on change as we go through the work that we do. If I was to stick to just E. coli, ground beef, you know, um, uh, hamburgers, fast food, uh, as it was in 1993, I would be missing a big part of the food safety story today. I had to adapt. Um, and uh, I like a lot of us have had to, to adapt in terms of, of, of food safety. And I want to point out too, before I run out of time, that one of the things that I've had to learn over time is that I didn't have to learn it, but I did, I did learn this over time. It's very easy for people in my position to point fingers, point blame, and talk about just the bad. Mm -hmm. But for every example of a bad actor, if you will, in terms of food safety, there are dozens, hundreds of examples of incredible people, incredible workforce, incredible teams, incredible companies that have gone above and beyond in terms of food safety to the point where they're even helping their competitors in terms of being better in terms of food safety. They're in alliances. They 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 break down these kind of competitive barriers to be part of, of uh, uh, conferences or publications and research and working with the government, uh, whatever it is uh, in terms of food safety. There's a lot of real good that's out there. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest changes that I 
I've had to make is that this idea of Herculean effort behind food safety is nothing that I point out is lacking. I want to make sure that I inspire and celebrate and acknowledge the Herculean effort that is out there, not just point to a lack of Herculean effort in certain corners of, of, of the food industry. Uh, and that has helped me not only with my audiences, but personally, that has helped me because it's a much healthier approach okay, to, yeah. to the work that I do. And it's, it's also sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet it reminds me of, you know, when we approach things with people have good intentions for the most part. And so even when we talk about the Herculean efforts, it's, there isn't somebody usually back there going, how do I, how do I sabotage this today? We're all working on this. And that's what I love about the food safety community, because we know that there are parts we don't know and we keep asking questions and we keep coming back as a community. We're not always making the exact progress we want every time, but yet we're still making steps forward. And the more we build the knowledge sharing and have those conversations, the more we actually do kind of the better together. And I think today, when as you talk about change theory, one thing we know for sure is it will be an ever-changing landscape as we go forward. But as we navigate those using a tool like this, or perhaps people have other tools they love, and we'd love to hear what those are, but here's another option to help you navigate through some of these changes that are that come whether we're asking for them or not, right? Well, and you know what, when you say words like landscape, mm -hmm. I think about the fact that, you know, that review of the jungle talked about a Hercules. Whereas today we can talk about the Herculean effort of many, very much like it takes a village kind mm -hmm. of an approach. There is no one person um, that, that, that can be our, our savior, if you will, in terms of food safety. Um, it is every person at every location at every moment and every mm -hmm. production line, every stage of, of the, the journey of food from farm to fork. Um, and, and, um, you know, and, and sometimes even participants that are not your traditional participants. As again, we keep seeing these changes in how uh, the food industry uh, works, especially in that last mile uh, with with uh, hybrids and, and delivery and, and, and uh, mail order services, things of that nature. But ultimately, um, when we start thinking more broad in terms of what does this landscape look, we have to realize that there's many different ways of optimizing how we frame these messages to these different audiences. What you say to the legal counsel and to the finance people is different than what you would say uh, to the 15 year old who's working at a fast food restaurant, mm -hmm. but they all play a very important role in food safety. Yeah. And no one can say, oh yeah, I'm sorry, this person did something wrong. They're new or they're only at this level in the company. When you're at the consumer, when you're the one who is at the end use kind of stage, Everyone should have taken the, the the best practices, the best efforts, and the best intentions in food safety, and a lot of that is dependent upon, um, you know, that that level of education and support along the way. And you know, I think that's a wonderful example because you know we kind of started this talking about how do we help even shift the conversation, and that's a great area where when you sit back and you think about, oh well, they're new, or well, they're in this role versus that role. How do we start shifting the conversation around that? Those are the things that help challenge us to say, how do we do it different? How do we help move things forward? Well, you know, I recently encountered a situation where I watched um, someone uh, cleaning off tables, sweeping the floor, wiping down the tables, and then immediately turning around and grabbing some cups out of a dishwasher. Uh, this is at a restaurant. Um, at a, at, and uh, grab those cups and grab some lemons and then pour water and drop the lemon in the cup and pour water. And I go over and ask the person if they were the manager. She says, yes. I said, do you realize that your employee just cleaned everything, wiped down, swept, uh, moved that trash, and then without washing his hands is now, you know, handling the cups out of the sanitizer and, and the, or, or the, uh, the lemon <laughs> slice and putting water and handing it over to people. Pretty and the person's response was, the manager's response was, well, he's new. Okay. So 
perhaps reaching out to readers, an audience that is just consumers, right? Because my first thought here is, but shouldn't anyone know that you should wash your hands after all these things, you know, like, and I've seen people take out trash to the dumpster. I've seen people go to the restroom. I've seen people go in smoke breaks and be on their phone and handle cash. And then they're going to handle food. And it's like, well, but they're a new employee. Okay. But even a new employee should know, should know. there's a connection there. So that's where uh, as a consumer, if we know these things, every, everyone who works in the food industry is a consumer, even if they're new, even if they're a highly paid executive, they're all a consumer. So if we if we really approach the idea of the message should go to the consumer level, perhaps that will not only help consumers, but it will help those younger, newer employees, recently hired employees have a baseline understanding that they don't have to be told that you should wash your hands before you do X, Y, and Z, or after mm -hmm. you do X, Y, and Z. Maybe we have an understanding of how this impacts food safety uh, overall. Yes. Yes. Gosh, Darren, I know we could prop I know we could talk all day and I know we could talk about other things too. Oh, I thought we were <laughs> going to talk all day here. <laughs> we're going to have, we'll have to do um, a real talk food safety marathon day. And then, Excellent. Th then we're going to sign you up for that one for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Watching the sunset behind me. Yes, exactly. Well, it has been a pleasure having you here. And if you're in the audience and you have further questions, you know, reach out to Darren or I put up our hello at foodsafetycatalyst.com email. You know, shoot us a message and we'll be happy to connect you with Darren. We're also going to be putting a copy of that template out on, we'll post that. So that way, you know, try it out. If you're looking for a different maybe methodology or communication tool, this might be one worth seeing how, how it works for you and how it's accepted. So it's been a pleasure having you, Darren. Um, we, we always appreciate the insights that you bring and we appreciate having our audience here with us to you know, join in the conversation and have some of these nuggets as takeaways. So we will be back again next week and we will be here on Wednesday at noon Eastern for another episode where we're going to talk about getting value out of conferences and how do you navigate what that looks like and which ones you go to and how do you, where do you go and what sessions and, you know, all kinds of talk about that because it is, we are in conference season. So can I point out that I actually, I often have these conversations with my students <laughs> they, don't know, they don't know, like, what should I go to? And if I go to it, what should I do when I get there? Right. Well, and that's why we're having this conversation, because I think sometimes people go, hey, do you want to go to this conference? And it's like, um, well, maybe. Like, wh wh what's the purpose? What are we going to get out of it? What can we add? You know, there's so many questions. So we're going to talk about that because that's another important aspect that sometimes we just don't pause to consider before we go. So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, Darren. And thank you, audience. We'll see you next week.